Hello and welcome back, everybody. We're here at Access to Perspectives Conversations, and I'm very glad to be joined today by Nadja Neumann, who is a long-standing friend. I was going to say old friend, but maybe that's true in some, some years to come. We've, we've met each other at Stockholm. Did we meet before that? But we've worked together at, or at the same time at Stockholm's University when I was doing my undergrads and you were doing your um, PhD studies. Um, yeah, and ever since we've been in loose contact and he, yeah, again, thank you very much for joining me today. And let's maybe start by you explaining to us Okay, so Nadia, you started off as a PhD student in molecular biology, where we spent some time together at uh, Stockholm University, and are now working as a research supporter, research manager at um, Karlstad University in Sweden. And yeah, please tell us a little bit about your, your journey, what led you from there to here, and yeah. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Johanna, that I get to join you. This is really fun. Um, so my journey is quite a long journey. Like you, I'm from Germany in the beginning, and I am um, love import to Sweden <laughs> because I met my husband in, in uh, Germany and moved to Sweden, where I, as you said, did my PhD in molecular biology. And already at that time during my PhD, I felt a little bit like um, there was a very big gap between science and the public. And whenever people asked me about my work, I found it really hard to explain what I'm doing. And during that time, I tried to get better and better at that. And I was also taking classes in scientific communication because in my mind, science is here for everyone and everyone should know what's happening at the universities. They're not ivory towers that no one has access to. So this is when my interest was born in, in scientific communication. And um, once I had finished my PhD, I, I felt like I wasn't really ready to continue for different reasons um, with research myself, but I wanted to be a link between research and the public and also between politics. Uh, because there's a lot of politics in that area too. Uh, so this is when um, we moved to, to another city, to Karlstad. I, I found um, a job first at the communication department. It was like a little project I had there. Uh, and then I finally got um, a job at the library where we had quite free hands actually to, um, to fix our job the way we wanted it to be. Um, and at that time, there was not much talk about scientific communication or even talking about the publication strategies for researchers that there has to be some work done in that area uh, to be successful in research. So this is the area I landed in, and this is where I'm still at today. So I work with a lot of different open science questions like open access, open data, and also, like I said, publishing strategies with researchers. Uh, and yeah, you also, uh, I think you know that we have a little podcast, uh, which I really love. Uh, it's <laughs> our little baby, uh, think, where we interview. To be honest, I think that was also one of the triggers for me to start my own podcast. I, like this was a nice, because also like you explained what your mission is with the podcast, it's called Forskningspodden. In Swedish, yes, translates to the pod about research, right. or how would you translate that to English? A research podcast, yeah. yeah. Du lyssnar på forskningspodden från Karlstads universitet. Här möter du forskare som tar dig med på en upptäcksresa i vetenskapen. Den här podcasten görs av universitetsbiblioteket. Hej och välkomna till forskningspodden med mig Nadja och dagens gäst. Um, and there you you meet with researchers from Karlstads University and I encourage them to explain about their research and to 
yeah, share what they're actually doing to a wider audience, to the listeners, to other Stockholm University um, students and staff, employees, um, but also for the general wider public. And that's also what I felt because you said you felt you felt a need for the an urge for that during your PhD studies, and the same was true for me. I I went through like for me it was always important to find a way to explain to myself, but also to um, my family and friends. And I also felt like the public deserves to know or needs to know, and that's also the essence of open access, um, especially when it's taxpayers' money that goes into research and. And most most of the fun, funds come from um, governmental yeah. uh, subsidies, um, and hence the knowledge that's generated through research is morally owned by the public. So it's on us researchers to explain to the public what we do with that money and what the benefits are from our work. But then I also felt that maybe it's not for everybody, and. Like, I think there's different breeds of researchers, those who are keen to work <laughs> on the intersection and those who want to dive right into the molecular world and are fascinated by that and don't want to hear and see anything else. Um, but yeah, so that's also what I think how we take similarly in that sense. And this is what I think yeah. also inspired me with when I listened to, you, to your podcast. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> Um, to because now with with this podcast here, my intention is to also um, trigger discussion about the topics that I'm passionate about in research, which all rotates around open science, but also and also what open science can um, allow us to do in terms of leveraging research results for societal benefits across all disciplines, really and. Um, for any stakeholder of society, really. But yeah, please tell us a little bit about the conversations you have in your pod. And is there like a recurring theme or like a common denominator that you experienced over the years? Well, our podcast is, um, is quite specific, actually, because what we do is um, in Sweden, you can have two different degrees during your PhD studies, which the first one is the licentiate, which is about two and a half years into your PhD studies, and then you defend your thesis and you uh, get your PhD degree. So what we do is that we approach the PhD students specifically in our podcast and ask them if they want to join us in Forskningspodden. And that is actually for two reasons or maybe even more, but uh, on the when we decided to, to start Forskningspodden, we felt that PhD students, there's too little light on PhD students in general and the work they do. So we wanted to encourage them and give them a possibility to have an outlet for their research um, and talk to the public in that way. And we thought also that this would be a good means for them to get some media training uh, because they get to talk to us. We record the podcast, but if they not like in a live radio program, when they say something wrong, it will be wrong and it will be out there. But in the podcast, we can um, modify like repeat the question and you can tell us again if, if you stumbled upon different things or um, so so these are the two aspects and what we do is that the podcasts are approximately 20 minutes and we ask the PhD students about their research what they have done what they experienced uh, their main results and yeah we try to answer within the podcast we try to help them package their research so that it's understandable for, for the general public. So it's not very detailed. It shouldn't be too detailed, uh, but more like a, the back cover of a book. It should mm -hmm. tell you about the thesis, but uh, in, a, in a very general way. And yeah. it's really fun. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, and also when I reflect back on my own experience, um, that's usually the case when I had to design a poster for a conference or you know, towards the end of my thesis when, um, when I write the actual thesis or a research paper, that's when you, when you again have the time and the necessary or necessity for generating headspace to step back and look at your research and contextualize it 
based on the findings and the learnings that, that we've done as researchers. And I think science communication does that more frequently if we are open to it. And like, did you also see such, I don't know, like in German we would say aha moments, I think that also works in English, um, where <laughs> the students that come to you to present their research on the podcast, they have like small eureka moments where they go like, oh yeah, this is why I do it again. <laughs> like, you know, that sometimes we get lost in the details. And then when we step back and see the bigger picture by explaining to somebody else, it puts our research or things into new perspectives. Did you see that happening sometimes or? Um, I, I don't know if, if I could say they had these eureka moments just yeah, um, while, we were, while we were podcasting, but um, we get some feedback where from the PhD students where they thought this was really helpful to just get them thinking mm. uh, because they had to say their, like tell their story in a, in a short amount of time. And um, they really had to think about the, like if the public would ask, so what's in it for me um, mm -hmm. and package it. Uh, so I think those are maybe the, the two most, um, most important Eureka moments. And then we usually have a question about what um, the PhD students would recommend to other people who want to become a PhD student. I think that also tells things because there's so many different opinions it's it's amazing actually we have i think 87 um, episodes now we didn't post the question in all of them but in most of them and and almost everyone had something else to contribute so that was maybe for me a eureka moment mm -hmm. it's it, it's so multifaceted the whole um thing and so, so many different experience baked into it and a very com complex um experience so to speak Mm, yeah. I hope that was a question to your answer. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's also a difficult question to answer that I posed to you, but um, but yeah, you you answered it beautifully. In other ways. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and is there like one example you could share with us, like one story that um, resonated with you, um, especially maybe because the topic was dear to your heart or because it was so important for the for the researcher to share about their research? Is there something that comes to mind? Well, um, close to my heart, um, I'm not sure, but I'm so happy to see the PhD students, how well they do, like how well they present their research and how much they uh, have considered different things and all the thought they have put into uh, both the research and then also in, in presenting it. Mm. So I'm, I'm really proud every time we are finished with the podcast and it feels like, wow, we really wrapped it and, and, the, and they are doing a really good job with it because it's, it's presenting, as you said, it's, it's taxpayer money most of the time and they are giving back to, to society. And also like what really is nice is that this podcast is completely voluntary, but um, I am really, um, in the beginning when we started it, we thought maybe some people say yes, but um, it's a lot more people saying yes than we ever expected. So mm -hmm. this is really nice too. That's warming my heart. So there is yeah. definitely an interest in meeting the, the public and mm. getting the research out there. Do you think that the experience with the pandemic has triggered some of that, that researchers and especially young researchers, early career researchers feel a need that they owe it to society to explain what they do to avoid misconceptions about science? And like irrespective of the um, study viruses or diseases, like across the topics, there might be a realization for us researchers to, we have to take ownership of the matter because we know the facts so, well and as much as facts are yeah. always or hardly ever one-sided which again makes it difficult to explain for research for non-researchers but okay so the question is do you, do you, did you see an increase in early career researchers wanting to share their stories out of the experience and um, the uncertainties that the pandemic brought with how much can we trust science now? What, like, 
what is this situation? without going too much into the corona debate mm. I, I don't want to go there but is there like no is there like a sense of we have to do better with science communication to avoid misconceptions in the future um honestly no i did no. we didn't experience any of this <laughs> so yeah, very yeah, short yeah, answer yeah. <laughs> i i didn't uh, it, it's a very good question but i don't think we could see a difference mm. so far maybe if we go further maybe there will be a change and we'll experience a change but um i i uh, i don't think it for our podcast at least i don't think there has been um, mm. a different mindset or anything or maybe indirectly in the sense that many people had to reorganize their workflow from home offices and then also realize there is a benefit in sharing stories about research and the research project in different ways i don't know um but you don't see a difference in numbers no. of people wanting to come and share the stories cool okay um and like if you would put it in one or two sentences what do you think is the purpose of science and research like we we said also also you kind of answered it already that um like there should be some societal benefit with it um but do you think research in itself can have a purpose or researchers doing the work of research it's a little bit philosophical now oh yeah that's a difficult <laughs> question but <laughs> what what i think well i would say for me research is um accumulating new knowledge that should be available for everyone who wants to know hmm. and everyone should be able to use it um the way they need to. Hmm. Very short. I don't know if that. No, no, it's on point, actually. Yeah, I'm thinking also because I work a lot on the African context. And when it comes to scholarly publishing, there is now a dominance of publishing in English and like, and there is a predominance of a way to describe research and research articles. It's very much known as Western way to communicate. Um, and you and I, we've seen, well, maybe you more than me, I don't know, like, well, I'm, I'm now digging, or I want to go towards this, like, multilingualism for once, like, dealing with more than one language in research, but also cultural identity, because in my view, um, research should be described in the mother tongue because often there's some cultural knowledge that's associated which easily gets lost in translation into english or technical writing also from english from spoken english to technical writing english even there but okay i'm probably opening pandora's box here um <laughs> in your experience as a researcher during a phd in sweden coming from germany and working in an international lab, your your PhD advisor was, well, your PhD advisor was, was Swedish, but then your postdoc advisor was Australian, right? Or uh, no, my PhD advisor, I never, I didn't oh, do okay. a postdoc. No, no, okay. Yeah. But my PhD advisor was from New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, sorry, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> but in the department, we had very many different nationalities. So the main language was English, Swedish, Swinglish. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. What does open science mean to you in your daily in your daily routines and work? How do you practice open science, or how do you support scholars in approach or in embracing open science practices? Well, in, in my job, open science is a very central thing, actually, um, especially the questions that um, touch upon open data and open uh, access for publications. Uh, because in Sweden, we have um, the Swedish uh, libraries have uh, gone together to uh, negotiate the different agreements with the publishers. Um, 
to to make open as access possible for as many people as possible um because as you know open access is usually paid by the one that sends in the articles in your daily routines and in your daily work how do you how do you support researchers in embracing open science practices what does open science mean in your research or in your work context okay well open science is very central in my work because i'm working um, with open access and open data i think i might have mentioned that before uh, so so we are supporting um, our researchers for example with the different agreements that we have with the publishers on a national level um, and so that they uh, get don't have to pay the fees themselves for open access publishing um, so I think we have currently 15 agreements with different publishers um, to cover the costs, the article processing charges. Uh, and I'm also in the group that works with open data. And we're still in baby shoes, I would say, um, at Castle University. We have worked a lot with it, um, but it's a very complex question and it's very many different issues that are involved in this. Um, from how do you... Um, make open data possible uh, but it's also the question about the general data management which is um, which we have to work a lot more with in the future to make it more organized and then there are so many different legal aspects in that regard too that it's a jungle when you are there and we're trying to um, navigate through that jungle mm. to find the right ways and make the path uh, ready for for our researchers to be able to actually publish their data in the end and to make sure we only publish the data that is okay to publish and, and um, not anything um, that might um, uh, identify uh, survey uh, people in the respondents in service and things like that. Mm. So, so it's a lot. It's a lot of open questions. But in general, obviously, we want open science because open science is important both for the research community but also for the globe in in general so that people can use and make the best of the results we have from research yeah i agree and it's also important that thank you for mentioning that because as much as there's now a big or a loud cry and call for open science and open science practices and open access and open data especially when it comes to open data as you just mentioned um, it's not as trivial and as easy because we have in Europe, we have GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, which in other parts of the world, they also have their own on super uh, regional level. And then there is each country has their own regulations besides that, which also need to com be complied with. And for a researcher, that's usually, well, I as a researcher, I didn't want to hear anything about legal stuff like like leave me alone <laughs> like that's for the lawyers um and now we have to deal with so much but i feel also at the end of the day it's 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 not too complicated how to license the data sets but then to make sure to comply with national like for, to to license your data sets in a way that just shouldn't disclose sensitive data of any kind but also to well but in the sense of fair um findable accessible and operable and reusable um what's usually recommended is to apply cc0 and cc by or either or preferably cc0 which then calls for make it publicly available in an online repository and then you might run into national legal standards and regulations which wouldn't allow you to to do that as a, as a researcher or the university so there we need a lot of stakeholders in the game to make these informed decisions what of our research output can we actually make how accessible but the first and most important step is to comply with the fair principles i think to make it findable and that can be closed it's also a common misconception that i observe and also had myself not too long ago that fair does not mean that the data should be open but it should be traceable and well documented. That's basically what it boils down to, which is also um, not always as trivial as it, as it, as it might seem. 
um, because then also here we need to comply with um, data privacy regulations and so on and so forth. So it's good that we have experts like you in positions to make sense of all of, of, all of that. Um, well, I, I just want to say I wouldn't oh. call myself an expert, but I really like it, but it's a field where you, it's a field of continuous learning. Yeah, for so everyone. I'm not an expert yet, but I, I, it's definitely a very interesting field to, to get into. Yeah. <laughs> and I, every meeting we have is a new learning step in that regard, I think. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure you Because know. it's so complex. I think expertise starts for me with being aware of what needs to be considered into the equation. Um, in the preparation for the for this episode, you said that your or that your favorite band or the musician that came to mind was the the Chili Peppers, yeah. and this is now also <laughs> the title for this episode. Um, can you share with us what fascinates you with that? I don't think you have to explain it a lot, but. No, it's just, I don't know, but their music awakens something in me. It sounds really strange, but every time there's uh, in on the radio or somewhere, it gives me like some happy feeling. And I just want to join their songs. And I, I really like their music. It touches upon something within me. Um, and I, I can't really, I don't know if you know this feeling, but it's just, uh, it, it kind of triggers me. And it has done so for many, many years. I mean, I've been a fan for, I don't know, 20 years probably. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and I get one never tired of them. song or just generally any song or many from there? Oh, there's many different ones. Mm -hmm. I, I like uh, most of their songs. I think when I. Not, not any in particular. During the time when we were both studying at Stockholm University, I always connect you with Coldplay. Is that still. Event you yeah, to? Coldplay I like too, but it's more the Chili Peppers I would really identify with. So mm -hmm. I, I still love Coldplay too, and and different, of course, there are different other bands too. Um, but I would say the Chili Peppers are the ones closest to my heart, <laughs> okay. even if they're old now too. <laughs> Oldish. <laughs> Oldish. Young at heart. Yeah. That's the most important part. Um, and then you mentioned that you have two researchers that you find inspiring. Who are these? Yeah, because you asked me. So um, I think, and you said they could be dead or alive. So um, I actually picked one that is dead and I picked one that is still alive. And the dead one is, um, I'm not sure, it's, it's more a philosopher, but it's Aristoteles. So I would really like to have met him at some point, or I would like to transfer him to our time now right. and see what he would say about that. Oh. Um, so uh, no, because what, what really inspires me with him is that he had all this great knowledge. I mean, he lived like 300 something years before Christ. And many of the things he had said are still valid. And many like of his research, research in, in biology and physics was still valid in the 16th, 17th hundred century. Mm. So he's, in my mind, he must have been one of the smartest persons on the planet and I would really have liked to meet him. Mm. Uh, another one that is still living today is uh, Johan Rockström. He is a Swedish researcher and he works a lot with uh, sustainability issues, global sustainability issues. And I think he has a very interesting take and he's also one of the researchers um, or like a team of researchers that have been involved in uh, the planetary uh, boundaries uh, framework, which um, like where they gave recommendations for uh, maintaining a safe operating space for human humanity. Uh, and he has also, I have a cooking book that he has written. So, I, and actually, I think I have met him because he used to be, or maybe still is a researcher at Stockholm University. And I took a course in aquatic management. And I think I might have crossed his path, but um, I don't know. And, and I would really like to talk to him because I'm really interested in these questions too, even if I'm not working with it. Um, and I would, would love to discuss with him how we 
as individuals can help to save this planet on what levels so i think he would have a lot of smart things to say to me. yeah maybe we can also <laughs> get him on your end this podcast in the future Who knows? yeah that would be nice i i think he's a very busy person but uh, it would be uh, great to have him i think okay. important questions yeah. he has to answer i think so yeah thank you so much yeah, that's for the two for for sharing all of that with us and um yeah it really speaks in or it's nice to see all those sparkles in your eyes when you talk about um that you're really passionate about the work that you do now and also back then and it's interesting to hear i guess also not only to me um how a journey can take from a phd in molecular biology to other um placements inside academia and also an intersection to a bridge to society and to ensure that science communication finds its way for towards science literacy also so that we can all learn from each other across cultures across countries and inside countries um, societal levels and stakeholders um, yeah thanks for doing such important work and for joining me in this podcast today and hopefully we're here yeah, you're most welcome um back um to the show anytime you want and i'm sure we'll okay. find other topics to talk about and hear more from you thank you very much nadia thank you johanna <laughs> Thank you.